Hey, this is episode 61 of the Gig Life Podcast. I'm your host, Stevie Taylor. Welcome to the show. This episode is a cracker, and I reckon you should tell your friends about it. My guest today is Australian drumming great Gordon Rittmeister. When you look at the upper echelon of any field, there's usually a handful of people that come to mind, right? So within the Australian drumming community, Gordo is one of these people. You only need to Google his name to see the enormous body of work he's amassed over his three plus decades on the instrument. And that work continues as he's still one of the most in-demand drummers around. Attitude facility and reliability keep Gordo as that first call guy, be it sessions or live gigs for jazz, big band, pop, rock, funk, fusion, even metal. We got together a wee while back and talked for over four hours about his career, music, drumming. For me, it was a real lesson in Australian music and drumming history taking place in my own home and uh, I feel very, very lucky for that. Due to the length of this, I've had to break it up into two parts, with this being part one, and part two will will follow soon. So let's get into it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm thrilled to give you part one of the Gig Life podcast with Gordon Rittmeister. Cheers. All right, I think we're rolling. Cool. Gordon Rittmeister, welcome to the Good Life Podcast. Thanks, man. How are you? Yeah, good, man. So? Yeah, good. Good. Thanks for having me. No worries. I just wanted to start um, telling the listeners how I know about Gordon Rittmeister and my ex- early experience with you. Now, um, when Australian Idol came on, I used to watch the band. I didn't used to watch the singers. And I told Mark Costa this too when I spoke to him. I used to just tune in to watch the band, you know. So... Did my research, found out who you guys were, because I came from New Zealand, sure, and um, hadn't really heard of you guys. Um, I'd heard of John Foreman because I'd seen him on the on the morning show. Burton Newton, yeah, yep. Right, yep. So um, anyway, put that aside for a second. I was I was playing a lot, and I was starting to get really stale on my playing. And I said to myself, I've got to find a teacher, someone around, you know, and. Um, and I didn't know who that was going to be at the time. And I was up at our local shops and I saw you there. You didn't see me. You didn't know who I was. Right. But I just saw you. Okay. I thought, oh, Gordon Rittmeister lives around here somewhere. Wonder, wonder if he does lessons, you know. It wouldn't be too far to go, you know. So I, I looked you up. I think it was your website or something. And there was a contact page. Yeah, yeah. Right. Sent, sent the contact and, and then hooked it up. And then, yeah, rocked up at your house one day. And, and I walked in there and you said, oh, so what do you want to know? And I just, I said, oh. Um, I just want to, you know, I've gotten really stale on my playing and want to learn some stuff. And you said, all right, I'll jump up on my drums, put the cans on. And I can't remember what the song was, but you got me to play along to something. Right. Yeah. Okay. And I played along and then at the end, you're like, oh, well, you, you, you know, your feel's good, your technique's good. Um, how about some of this stuff? And you pulled out a sheet and there was like a Mozambique, Groove there and some other Afro-Cuban stuff, and okay. we worked a little bit through that, and then, and then, um, then you said to me, "Have you heard of Tower Power?" And I said, "No, I haven't." And you, and you said, "Listen to this." So hang on, I've just dialed up a song, <laughs> and this was the song too. Okay. Right, so you played me that. There's four bars in front. Right? Yeah. <laughs> and you got up on your drums and you played that. Oh, and it really? fucking floored me, eh? Okay. Yeah. And yeah, I right. went, fuck, all right, cool. And um, and then you, yeah, you told me a bit about David Garibaldi and you put me onto the Future Sounds book. Well, yeah, I, I, I imagine, um, 
Yeah, that's kind of my go-to thing when people are um, the two sound level concept and all that, yeah. and, and the ghost, you know, yeah. making less of the ghost notes and more of the yeah. accents and so on. But yeah, sorry, carry on. Yeah, no, but, well, well that, that's basically it. And then, right. you, yeah, you, you introduced me to the Future Sounds book and I, I went out and bought it and yeah, yeah. studied it and it was, it was awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was great. And then there was one other time I went back, it might have been a year later, yeah, two years later, um, I was getting uh, lots of songs sent to me and, and having to turn them around quickly and, and, you know, messing up, not knowing how to really write mud map charts, you know. So I went to you and you showed me your sort of, it was almost like a freehand way of just writing these basic charts. Right, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, yeah. okay. Yeah, so that's it. Excellent. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's good that you got something. <laughs> oh, I sure did, yeah. <laughs> that's cool. Yeah, man. So, um, look, what's a, what's a week in the life of Gordon Rittmeister these days? Well, uh-huh. Let's just talk about this week and then we'll go back to sort of... <laughs> Well, early days, you know. This week's a funny week. I mean, it, look, it's always different. Um, I'm about to go into a month of of chaos, actually. Um, uh, I, <laughs> a Glenn Wilson is doing. Uh, he's he's doing Billy Elliot's coming up. Oh right. And um, stage show. Yeah. Yeah. But he um, he's on. Uh, he's currently on West Side Story, and he he couldn't do the first month of Billy Elliot, like something happened and the dates, I don't know, the dates got changed. So um, Michael has a party, um, called me and said, look, you ha- would you be interested in doing a month on, on the show? And um, I've never done a show before. Oh, you haven't? No, not a, no, oh, right. not, not a proper, like the closest thing I got was um, playing with Tom Berlinson doing his Frank Sinatra thing. Right. Which is, I suppose it's a show, but it was a a concert of Sinatra music with a, a monologue, you know, right. him, him sort of telling the Sinatra story. Right. That's another story. But yep. um, so this, this, so I said, yeah, right, I'll, you know, I'll do that. Um, and so this shows like this, like eight shows a week, I think it is. Uh, two shows Wednesday, th- uh, Thursday, Friday, two shows Saturday, two shows Sunday. Well, how many is that? Uh, anyway. Whatever, I can't, whatever it is. Yep. And, but I've managed somehow to fill up every day in between <laughs> with stuff. Um, uh, going down to James Morrison's school in um, Mount Gambia for, for like a Monday and Tuesday. So that like, and you know, get, you've got to get up at sort of like it's a six or seven o'clock flight or whatever right. to Melbourne, then fly to Mount Gambia, do two days of teaching and fly back that night on the Tuesday night to do two shows on the Wednesday. And then uh, I, I, it happens on one of the Thursdays I've got gig in the day. You know, it's just, it's oh, just man. chaos. Like Crazy. That's, um, that's must, and, must be a little bit like the old days, isn't it? Well, yeah, you know, it, it's, it, it really is. And I, I'm sort of, uh, I'm kind of, I'm hoping my, my body can handle it. Cause <laughs> I kinda, actually, it, it's funny because I, I can, um, you know, do some physical work around the house and really, kind of strain myself these days yeah but and I kind of worry but then I sit down the drums and and nothing hurts because I've just been doing it so long I guess yeah, it's right. just, you know at all that was something I was going to ask you about but later too right yeah, yeah. injuries yeah well yeah yeah and how you sort of maintain yourself and well <laughs> maintain you know with this stuff um <laughs> he's putting it his bottle of Pepsi Max yeah that's right while I'm drinking my um Carlton Draft <laughs> this episode was what no, I'm just kidding yeah. well <laughs> You know, I could just about own half the company. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so you know, uh, um, the, no two weeks are the same. Uh, no, you know, I've got three kids now and yep. two teenage girls and a and, yeah, a, right. and a boy is nine. So um, it's full on. And that, like, I'm what I'm finding hard these days is the you know going away on the weekends and stuff. Like yeah. To, just missing them. Yeah. Growing like n- not not I, I'm seeing them a lot, but. Um, you miss it. You do miss important things. You miss the exactly sport days mean. and all yep. that stuff. It gets hard, you know. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's let's roll back now. I, um, I've you know I did find some um, print interviews and stuff that he done, and and I'll probably I can put some links to that in the show notes. And I don't I don't think we need to go through your whole career because it's massive, you know. Oh, well. Um, well. <laughs> Me and and just about everybody else think so. Maybe you don't. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. I sort of think I'm, yeah, I, I'm, I'm having the same career, 
you know, right. once a year, round and round again. Yeah, know? right. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, you know, I've got a bunch of topics. Um, you know, I'd like to like to talk about and um, yeah, yeah. Am I on and, mic enough? Is that right? Yeah, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds yeah. good. Um, and I also put it out there a little bit for people to um, if they had any questions for you. So <laughs> okay, right. I've got a few of those, not not too many and. And I also spoke to some of your friends too. So, ah, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. oh no, it's all good. Okay, it's all good. Yeah, yeah. No, we don't do that here. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about your your early days. Um, now, uh, music in your family. Um, yes. In uh, my sister was. Uh, I've, got, I've got got an older sister, six years older, and a brother, um, sort of two years older. I think. My dad would probably have been musical if he'd had a had the chance, but he he's um you know he's a Holocaust survivor from the war and and um you know that's a whole story. But they but he never got the opportunity to play. But I know when whenever we'd visit somebody's place who had a piano, he'd go and sit at the piano and pick out tunes. So I think he sort of had an ear for music and stuff, but um you know never the opportunity and you know left it too late sort of thing. Mm. I don't. I'll, I'll never really know. Cause he died when I was seventeen, um, oh, right. okay. of a heart attack, actually. And so you know, that's that's another story again. But um, uh, so so really, I think the main. The other thing to, too was that music seemed to be more predominant everywhere. Um, you know, for anyone, I'm fifty one. For anyone my age, and mm. you know, maybe ten years younger. Yeah. I, I grew up watching Countdown, yep. and and um, so it was on every week, and it was, and everybody watched it. Mm. Um, and there were other other music shows on, and they all, um, you know, like music was everywhere. Mm. But my sister, so that was the sort of pop music, the Oz Rock right. and pop music of the day. But my sister had, um, she was into all the good '70s stuff. Mm. Um, you know, Wings, uh, Little River Band, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, right. um, Skyhooks, you know, um, um, you know, Janie Mitchell, Bob Dylan, right. uh, Super Tramp, uh, Boz Skaggs, Fleetwood Mac, the whole... All the good stuff. You know, yeah. Mm. Actually, I was thinking because um, I... She had the single of Lido Shuffle and I know you, you did your Jeff Beccaro show recently mm. and I was thinking... Um, I I only just started learning the drums, at, you know, through school, mm. and I had a teacher there, and I'd learned to play a simple straight eighth rock beat, mm. and you know, like one and three on the kick drum and two and four on the snare and eighths on the hats, and um, my sister had the single of Lido Shuffle, and I had I'd bought this little stereo from my neighbour, like a little plastic stereo. A uh, little, little record player, and um, I didn't realise you could play LPs on it because the <laughs> it had this pl- clear plastic lid that I just leant up against the wall, and that was at ninety degrees, <laughs> so you couldn't fit a f- right. like a, couldn't fit an LP on it. Right. You could only fit a single on it, not realising you could take the lid off and put the you know put. So a did you on think it. there was a whole other machine for the <laughs> LPs? <laughs> I didn't, didn't know what was going? On. But so I'd pl- <laughs> well, I, I mean, I eventually must have worked it out. But initially, I, you know, I just played singles on it. But um, anyway, she had this Lido Shuffle lying around, and I, you know, the, I was really drawn to that beat. Um, so I came home from my lesson, having learnt this straight eighth rock beat, and um, put put that single on and started playing along and realised I had to sort of bend my right hand to to make it line up with the triplet, you know, with the shuffle. Right. And that's how I learnt to play a shuffle. Right. So I, I kind of think I, I would say I learnt to play a shuffle from Jeff Beccari. You know? Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> did you – could you hear the – I mean, did you have a, um, an understanding of the ghost note type thing? Could you could you hear that or was it just the um, – I, I can't remember, yeah, but right. probably more it was the shuffle, like it's the sense the shuffle of, part, yeah. of, you know, the, the first and third yep. partial of a triplet, you know, yep. just getting that. Um, but, I, but I sort of understood that mathematically and, and visually straight away. Like that wasn't a, a big leap, but, uh, you know, yeah, right, I understood right. where that was coming from, you know. Um, anyway, but yeah, sorry, the question was um, 
about music and the family. So I've, I've already, but but yeah, m- mainly the main thrust of it was from my sister. Right. Um, she played guitar, and you know, sang, used to sing folky songs. We used to sing a lot in the car. Right. The, the, you know, the family. Um, David Jones told me that you're actually quite a good singer. Did he? He sure did. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I'll have to have a word with David Jones. <laughs> you know, he, he I, me. I, I, you're a really good singer. I, I like a sing. I don't, yeah. I, you know, and I do. I do. I love the singers. I love the sing. I really. Um, do you sing on gigs or sessions? Or n- not really. No. Yeah. No. I mean, you know, like for a bit of a joke, I have. But um, <laughs> I've no, not really. I recently did. Um, uh, I, I mean, I work in Glenn Shorrock's band from Little River Band. Yeah. And um, we had a gig, and Johnny Bettison plays guitar. And John's a John's a king singer. He's yeah. a he's a proper like he's a he's a you know he's a great front man. Right. Let alone BV singer. The the BVs is Emil Nelson on on bass and John doing backing vocals. Yeah. So we do all the little river band stuff. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, Johnny Bill, Bill play piano and Rizby, yep, yeah, yep. yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, so um, and Rex goes the other guitar player. Yep. Um, Johnny couldn't. He double booked himself on this gig and. Um, it was out in Dubbo and Glenn didn't book and he didn't – something happened. There was no no second guitar. But it wasn't just second guitar, no no third vocal, you know. And Glenn said to me, oh, do you want to have a go at it, you know. And, <laughs> and I, I, I said, oh, yeah, sure. Like a few days out and then a couple of days later I rang him back. I said, mate, it's, you know, no. It's not going to happen. <laughs> not going to happen. I mean, I, I, I can sort of sing in tune if I really know the melody, if I really know right. the part, you know. Okay. But it's too, you know, I, like I'm really easily led and I'll, I'll jump on the lead line yeah, instead, right. of the, okay. you know, yeah. instead of the harmony. Yeah. If I really know it, I'm, I'm cool. But, yeah. you know, it was just, you know, it was not my, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good enough for that, you know. But, and Risby had a crack at it, so. Right. <laughs> I think he struggled just quietly. So. Yeah. <laughs> But you know, you're talking about B. Bertles and um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Graham Gable. You know, right? There's just that <laughs> psychology there that on your guys' part, oh, we we can't pull this off. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, those guys, you know, Beddoes and um, Emil, they're proper singers. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not something you just, I could, not something I could just do. No. Yeah, no, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I do like the singers. I, I've always. Um, I, I, you know, I'm turned on by great, you know, Donny Hathaway and Stevie oh, Wonder. Good one, yeah. Um, we were listening to Shaka Khan with my daughter on the way back from dancing tonight. Um, you know, Aretha, Sinatra. I love Sinatra. Right. You know, I like. I like. Yeah. Any of the, any of the mod modern day singers? <laughs> Look, I, you know, I'm. Uh, one of my sort of standard joke lines is I'm basically about 10 or 15 years behind whatever's going on. Right, okay. Um, during the 80s, you know, when I was in high school and everyone was listening to the stuff, um, I was into Led Zeppelin, you know. I was yep. sort of – I was. that's when I discovered John Bonham. Although, as I say, my sister had the Led Zeppelin record. So I, I was familiar with that music, but I started playing the drums when I got to year seven yep. in high school. And, which, and by that time my sister – moved out of the house or, or she I think she moved out that year um and but I sort of uh, you know so I'd, I'd sort of lost contact with Led Zeppelin in a way when she moved out but once I started playing the drums I you know I put on one of her records <laughs> having worked out that I could play the LPs <laughs> and um you know and Bonham just Blew me away. That right. was and that so was Bonham. Was Bonham the guy that made you say, "I want to play drums"? No, uh, okay. No, I'd already started playing drums. Um, no, the thing that well, I was always attracted to the drums. You know, okay. Um, there are a couple of things. There was a guy in my primary school who was later in my high school. There's an older guy called Paul Smith, and he played the drums. And I remember in the primary school. I was – he was probably four or five years ahead of me. We had a variety concert, whatever, and he, he got up and did a drum solo at this variety concert. Right. And that stayed with me for years, you know. Okay. Um, <laughs> and then and then he was sort of he, – he would have been my sister's year or maybe a year younger. But when in her high school – when she was in high school, they did a musical which was written by one of the students and it was a rock a rock musical – uh, and I went along and saw that, and they had the band set up to the right of the stage. And I remember 
I didn't know what happened on stage all night. I was just staring at the drummer all night, staring at Paul. It was Paul Smith, you know. Mm. Um, so, and that was, you know, I would have been still in um, primary school. Right. Um, so I always sort of dug the drums. And then when I got to high school, there was an opportunity to, to learn them through the school. They had, a, you know, a teachers coming in and right. doing that. And I think it was two bucks for a class lesson sort of thing. Right. And um, I signed up and, you know, really ran with it you know mm. I, I just I, I loved it um and the my first teacher was a guy called Moro Ruby um and he was great he's he, he's I think he lives in LA now but he was fantastic he played traditional grip and he he gave us you know rudiments and reading rhythms and some rock beats you know like a great start you a little, know a little bit of everything yeah yeah mm. um kept it interesting but you know i have to say sorry what was your most recent question <laughs> don't worry about the questions I, I don't think um because we'll end up bouncing around and yeah well i can but, ramble you know yeah i i I, the, I guess the first question was to just to um you know how you started out and then you sort of went to bonham and i think i asked you was bonham your R- that's right yeah that the, well the, no mm. um i'd heard bonham because of but not – I'd heard him before playing the drums mm. and, you know, I mean, I I can remember – I mean, in my street it was like Led Zeppelin and Status Quo were, you right. know, the big big things everybody was into. Mm. And I remember, you know, the beginning of Black Dog and like that – I mean, the, the fourth Led Zeppelin album was uh, – you, you know, that had a big impact on me before I played the drums. So, you know, right. like I really um, was moved by – by it, you know. Um, so I started playing the drums in year seven with this guy, Moro Ruby, and mm. um, and I signed up for the school band and all that sort of stuff. Uh, and then must have been somewhere in that, f- sometime in that first year of high school too that I, I heard Bonham again, mm. or like heard Led Zeppelin having started playing, you know, having me having started playing the drums. And, um, you know, it was amazing. Then, then, it, then I realized, like I could, you know, he was, he was amazing. It was um, mm. because the drum kit, for one thing, the kit sounded like a kit. Yeah, it didn't sound like a processed eighties. You right. know, I mean, I was in high school in eighty one. Yeah. So what was the what were the bands that you were hearing that had that? Well, I guess. Processed. Well, I guess pro- possibly in later high school, but you right. know, you know, I mean, like all the new wave right. um, okay. English stuff was big, like the. Um, you know, Duran Duran and I gotcha. um, ABC and right. um, Spandau Ballet and yep. all that so stuff. So Lynn, Lynn drums and Simmons drums and that. that yeah, was and the big gated prevalent. snare thing and, yeah, right. and all that. Yep. Whereas you, you heard Bonham and it sounded like a Drum guy kit. in a room yeah. playing a, a kit really, yep. you know, beautifully. Um, and I think in a way the the... The thing, the, the, I, like I was always drawn to the groove, you know, like, and I hear I hear it now and it kills me. Like the, the yeah. groove is the thing, the snare sound and the, you know, the, the, the pocket is just so, mm. so beautiful. Um, so, yeah, like, it, you know, it was, uh, I started playing and I learnt some f- foundational stuff mm. from a teacher mm. um, and Bonham was, and then there was the impact of Bonham. Mm. Um, and... You've got a beautiful Simon Phillips poster there on your wall. Do you know how many episodes that poster's been talked about? Yeah, I bet. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everyone that sits here goes, "Oh, Simon Phillips," and then I tell the story. And yeah, you know. well, yeah. well, can he's, I say, he's special. Yeah, please go. Yeah, yeah. Go, go on. You, no, me. I guess say he's yeah, pretty special drummer. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, look, my first encounter with Simon was, um, ha, you know, would have been probably 1983. So I would have been playing for two, two or three years. Um, and you know, as I, like, as I say, I was mad for Led Zeppelin. I mean, I, I was, I was, um, you know, I look back now, like I was a zealot, and I was, I'd be sort of, I'd find so much joy and beauty in this music, and that I would try to um, convert people, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean, uh, like, like, and you know, some people just don't hear it the same way. So yeah. you know, like I, I kind of learned. Took me a long time to learn, but I learned that you know. That's what that's what taste is, you know. But, <laughs> but um, so I was mad for Led Zeppelin, and uh, I remember watching. I don't know if you've ever come across the Ronnie Lane Benefit concert for Arms. No. Well, that would have been eighty three, I think, and um, 
it was a concept concept for Ronnie Lane. He had multiple sclerosis, and right. um, it was an all star band. But the feature the feature of the band was um, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, and Eric Clapton, right. the guitar players from the Yardbirds. And um, so you know, I'm a Zeppelin fan. I'm on. I'm thinking, oh, Jimmy Page is on. This is great. And it mm. was simulcast on Triple M. Mm. You know, it was on Channel Ten and Triple M. And I'm watching this thing, and um, and the house band is uh, Charlie Watts on drums and Kenny Jones from the Faces and later the Who. Mm -hmm. um, Steve Winwood was on piano, Chris Stainton, um, who, oh, Bill Bill Wyman on bass, Ray Cooper on percussion, um, like all heavyweights, you know, like, like English kind of yep. rock royalty, you know. Um, and they, you know, and they're playing with Eric Clapton, and and um, <laughs> and then Jeff Beck comes on, and he's got this guy on dr drums, you know, with the double bass drum, Tama Art Star, <laughs> you know, uh, wood, the big power toms, the wood was it red? Fish. Is it the sort red, of the, the brownie, red? brownie raw, like a oh, right, like, mahogany kind of uh, right, okay. beautiful, you know. And because I had the Tama catalog, and that was the big, that was the, uh, right, the okay. kind of cool drum, <laughs> the cool <laughs> kit, yeah. And this cat playing the drums, um, Simon Phillips, and I, I was just absolutely floored because I'd never heard um, kind of pocket like that. Like he played, um, they play the pump, you know, that Jeff Beck tune, you, you, it's, and it's just it's the first beat we all learnt. It's one and three on the kick drum, two and four on the snare, and mm. and eights on the hat. But I'd never heard it played like that, and just had so much kind of grease and groove, right. you know. Um, and then they played a, a bunch of other tunes, which I later went on to, you know, know. Um, but uh, they played uh, Lead Boots and um, Star Cycle, uh, Hi-Ho Silver Lining, like Great Shuffle. Um, but that was my introduction to Simon. And, right. and I remember just like every time he'd come on screen, I'd have this rush of excitement, like to, oh, wow. to, what, to, to you know, see him play the drums, let alone hear him, you know. It was just, yeah, he was he was incredible. I'd never seen anything or heard anything like it, you know. So that he he had a big impact on me, Simon. Yeah. Yeah. The, my first um, experience with Simon was my friend lent me the um, his first instructional video. Yep. Where he played the stuff off his Protocol album. Yeah. Yeah. He had the head headband on the the Tama track pants. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You know. So I still just blew me away. Yeah, oh. Right. Well, I still think of that as pretty new, and I—I I mean, I think of right. the um, Pete Townsend's White City album as sort right. of new, recent. Yeah, yeah. That's 1985, man. Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> you know, I was sort of right in there, and I mean, oh, give blood, fuck. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, Pino's playing bass on that. Yeah, right? yeah. That's, that's a killer track. Yeah, and yeah. Face the face. All face that, the face. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's also got um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, Mark Brzezerski um, from Big Countries on right, a couple um, of tracks on that yeah, too. Right. It plays great. Mm. But yeah, Simon, you know. I mean, I, I went out and got everything I could. Well, and this is this is a, a, a little routine I tell students about. You know, um, look from that experience, I saw this Simon on the um, Ronnie Lane Benefit concert. I went into town. There was a shop in town called um, Utopia Records. It was um, the home of heavy metal, right? But they were kind of guitar-y type cats in there, you know. And I went in there and, um, like, so, you know, I lived at Ryde, grew up in Ryde, caught the bus in, went in there in Martin Place, I think, or downstairs in some joint in Martin Place. I went down, asked them about Jeff Beck, because um, I, <laughs> the, 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 I don't know how I worked it out, but the, the, rec, the, the song The Pump came off this record there and back. And they had it, must have had it in a catalogue or something, I saw this there and back, because on the Ronnie Lane Benefit, concert there's a guy wearing a there and back t-shirt <laughs> i put two and two together and went and i i ordered this album it was an import you know it's probably 30 bucks back in the 80s you know yep. um which is big money for a kid yeah. in high school uh it took you know a couple of months to come in they ring you up you know, i caught the bus back into town go in and get this record and put it on and you know i i loved it it's, that's a that's a cracking record yep. um and Simon's really young. It's got um, Space Boogie on it, you yeah, know, the, yeah. the shuffle in seven, yep. double double bass drum shuffle. Um, it's got uh, this thing called El Beco, which is a great 
kind of rocking thing. Another great tune called Too Much to Lose. Like really great, you know, great writing and great playing and yep. um, really of its time too, like a fantastic, you know, mm. record. And um, But that that whole thing was a journey for me that, that, that took a long time. Mm. Um, today, if someone discovers, you know, Simon Phillips on YouTube, it's, you, you know, you go on to the next link and you're seeing the next thing within within five minutes before you've got, yeah, I know, you know, you know so yeah. you're not really. You don't have that time to dig really deep unless, yeah. unless you, you go in there with that in mind. Eh? Well, that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're sort of, you're yeah. kind of distracted by the line of, lineup of things that are coming on the site, you know, like, yeah. And yeah. you don't develop a rapport with it and get it, get it, you know, like because I, because I lived that, you know, we had I had it on VHS that concert and yep. you know played it over and over again, bored my friends to tears with it, you know, like because like, yeah. like, yeah. you know I couldn't like all, they were all listening to you know yeah. Culture Club and Duran Duran, yeah, yeah. or, or no, nah, probably <laughs> Cold Chisel and Midnight yeah. Oil, but you know I'm listening to this sort of English yeah. fusion, you know, like yeah. <laughs> you see once you know once I. Watched that tape. I, I don't know how many times I watched it, but and then one day I was just going through Mum and Dad's record collection, and I pulled out this this um, Art Garfunkel yep. record. Um, and there's the song called Misty Nights, and I was looking at the 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 notes and it says drum Simon Phillips, and right. I went, is it the same Simon Phillips? Obviously, there's no <laughs> there's no internet to go and have a look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Don't know how I found out, but I found that it was actually it was actually him, mm. and it's a very simple groove that he plays on it, and mm. it's kind of like, oh, what's he doing there, you know? And um, at his clinic um, a few years ago at Canterbury Leagues Club, I got to ask a question, right? And he says, and I said, oh, thanks, hey, thanks for coming, you know, it was great to see you. Now you played on a track called Misty Nights on uh, Garfunkel. Do you remember that session? And he goes, oh, man, I was doing lots of sessions that day. And he goes, but I do remember, I said, the, I, the, the producer was a real asshole <laughs> because he remembers that. And the producer was trying to get him to um, position his snare drum on like a really, really tight angle because right. that's what he'd seen or something. Oh, that's right. what he remembered about that session. Wow. Yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 So it was, well, it's good to know that <laughs> that stuff happens to him too. Yeah, yeah, right? of course, so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, man, like, what a career! What a yeah. like, you know, it's one thing to have played on a lot of records, but it's another thing to have played on a lot of, like, that many significant records. You know, like that, like that were musically significant because of your contribution, but also because of the music. You know, like, yeah. I mean, it's you know, there's some really important yeah. things that he, you know, that he did. Like, and man, one you know, one thing after another, it was yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, but even before he moved to America, and Toto, I was, you know, mm. I'd been a fan. I had all the stuff that he'd done right. with Judas Priest, and you know, yeah. like everything, Mike Oldfield, all that, you know, yeah. like, um, yeah, I loved his thing. I, yeah, you know, he had this great pocket, and you know, I realized later, like, he got a lot of stuff from Billy Cobham and, and all that, yeah. but um, that was another fortunate thing that happened for me. Um, was in in high school was then I had this uh, teacher that, who that was just the industrial arts teacher happened to be um, what they call our form patron the guy who looked after our year at school um, and he was a music enthusiast and um, he used to, he was a sound guy as well he used to go and do sound gigs and stuff but mm. he was the first guy he was a kind of hi fi um, you know nut and he, he he was the first guy to have a CD player right. Um, and he had this, you know, like a Sony portable Walkman CD. Um, and as a result, like I'm talking '83, like a, like right at the at the when CDs first hit, right. you know. Yep. And a lot of the early CDs were kind of the, the high end jazz labels and like GRP records. Yep, yep, yep. Um, and Billy Cobham had signed with GRP, so I got to hear Billy Cobham through him, through this teacher at school. He had he had these CDs, you know. Um, uh, there was one called, I think it was called Warning, and it had a version of Stratus on it, you know, like Cobham playing, and that had a big impact on me. Mm. Um, he also, GRP was Chick Corea Electric Band, and so I heard, you know, just by being in the right place at the right time, I got exposed to Dave Weckl when he hit with Chick in 1985 when it happened, you know. 
um, not knowing, not really understanding it, but mm. but I heard it, you know, mm. and I could, I was affected by it, you know, um, and that was just by virtue of this teacher having these records. He he also had you know stuff with Jack DeJunette and a lot of things with Steve Gadd. Mm. Um, in fact, I heard Steve Gadd first through him. The other thing he had was um, a laser disc, the the sort of size of a LP. Yeah. A laser disc, which never really took off here, but it was big in Japan. Mm. And he had there were two two concerts he had on. He had a number of concerts, but amongst them were um, were the Simon and Garfunkel in Central Park. Oh yeah, which is yeah still I got to tell you brings me to tears. Like it, yeah. like I'm just so moved by that Steve Gadd. That live and version of 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover. Oh. 50 Ways, all oh. of it, all of it. I mean, I mean you know, like, like Mrs. Robinson, like, the, you know, the, the thing they get going on that, like, you know, it's Anthony Jackson, Eric Gale, um, Richard T. It's those cats, man. And they, they played a certain way at that time mm. that was so funky and so together and so deep, um, simple but deep. And, mm. uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I say that now, I didn't, didn't I mean I felt it, but I didn't know what was going on. I understand. You know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but funnily enough, the other the other one I was talking about that he had was a Grover Washington DVD. I don't know if you've seen that one, which is the same rhythm section. Oh right. Steve Gadd, Anthony Jackson, um, Ralph McDonald on percussion, and that thing's killing. Like it's right. you know, but when those with with those guys playing, it's really meaningful. You know, it's really incredibly deep. You know, the the pocket I, for me, it was really. Um, really something. You know, I, I hear that now, knowing you know a lot more. Hopefully, <laughs> and but it still it still gets me. I, I know still, what you're saying. You know. Yeah, yeah. So how did this um did did this have a direct impact on the way you started approaching drums yourself? Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. I was sort of um, well, for for one thing, you know, I grew up as I said, like watching Countdown and. With that, all that seventies rock stuff from my sister, and I guess like jazz was not on the radar at all. Um, but hearing, well, you know, going from sort of John Bonham to Simon Phillips, that was sort of, you know, there were fusion elements in Simon, particularly with Jeff Beck, mm. and then Steve Gadd. Right, Steve Gadd, you know, is. It, it, it's like he comes out of jazz. He's a he's yep. a he's a jazz guy. Mm. Um, it was kind of a, a, a foot and a bridge into into jazz. Yep. Um, and then the other thing that happened too was I got exposed to David Jones. You know, right? And still am. <laughs> mm. You know, really taken with David mm. because you know he he had this. He was so virtuosic and like, can, you, you know, I mean, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Like if you just want to talk about facility on the drums, mm. um, all the cats, um, Dave Weckl and Steve Smith and various others have gone and seen um, Freddie Gruber. Right. And, uh, you know, he's a kind of movement guy who, who you know, as I say, he was mates with Buddy Rich and I've spoken to Weckl about, <laughs> about him. Um, cause he's a, he was a real character. He's not with us anymore, but he was a, he was a real character. And he, he, um, he hipped all these guys to stuff that Buddy was doing mm. and it's just physical stuff. And you like, you know, you see the way Weckles changed his approach to the drum kit and Steve Smith and in a way like, and, you know, moved stuff around and, mm. and, and all that. Well, Davy Jones was onto that. Right from the beginning, you know, he was onto that. He had it all going down, you know. So the actual physical part of playing the drums, mm. he had, you know, covered the, in in this sort of Buddy Rich way, you know. Right. Um, that's my that's my take on it. But yeah. you know, but apart from you know, then then there's the character and the music musicality and the you yeah. know the beauty of it all. Mm. Like so, I became a kind of David Jones worshipper, you know. <laughs> The House of David, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and you know, I used to go and see. I, I tell, I mean, I like. How's this for stalky? Uh, I, <laughs> I was watching. Um, I, I got an interesting story about David, which I mean, it's just curious. My wife's mother was a singer, and she 
was like a studio singer, did a lot of sessions, but she worked on um, all the Melbourne Tonight shows and all that stuff. Came up through the years, and but later on became after sort of finishing singing, she became involved in the administration in Channel Nine and all that stuff in the in those Tonight shows, Don Lane show. And oh, sorry, I'll come back to that. Yep. So I was I'm watching the Don Lane show was this. Tonight Show, yep. I don't know if you... you, you probably, uh, uh, when I first came to Australia, I think it might have... I don't know if it was still on it and had come back, but it was It was on at that time. Well, there was a later show on um, Channel 10 that they picked it up, and that was a small group. That was, oh, that Vic, was probably Victor it. and Doug Gallagher. Oh, right. Jamie Rigg right. Um, and Clive Landich, I think, played guitar. Um, but the previous show to that was out of Melbourne. Right. And that was a big band, Graham Morgan on the drums, you know. Gary Hyde played congas a lot. Right. Um, <laughs> Bobby Venier on trumpet. Anyway, I'm watching this show and this guy comes on and plays with a band called Pyramid. And I'd never sort of heard drumming like it or seen drumming like it. Like he had these rubber arms and beautiful mm. flowing mm. round motion, traditional grip and playing the, the hell out of the drums, like really caning them but mm. – but beautiful grace and you know turns out it's david jones pyramid um and you know but then that that had a big impact on me i I think i heard him a couple of times in different things Mm. over the years Mm. and then i saw him on the news playing in um hyde park you know and a gig at the festival of sydney so i went in you know went in to see him it was like a daytime gig and you know, he wasn't there. I went in every day and, t- and he came back and did this gig. It was a, um, and it, by this time he got into his um, meditation thing and it was, it was, it was part of that, you know, it was a band he had called Across Time. Anyway, so I got to meet him, you know, like, uh, you know, that was sort of real fandom. <laughs> um, but the, yeah, the story I was going to say about my mother-in-law was that she, by the time she, um, David came on the, um, Don Lane show, she booked the band Pyramid to come on the show. And um, Peter Feynman was the director or the producer of the show. And he gave, he bawled her out for putting this jazz crap on. You know, that, what oh, are you right. doing? You know, like he, she got in real trouble for putting this jazz, you know, this jazz band on. And then the week later, he apologised because it was received so well, you know, <laughs> it had gone over so well. Um, but there you go. That was just a little, yeah, right. uh, you know, uh, ironic connection. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. turns out this was yeah. to be my mother-in-law who's responsible for getting David Jones on the TV right. for me to see, you know. Gotcha. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, where are we at? David Jones. David, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, he, he was, and, you know, from a, and then he'd moved to Sydney um, when he got into the Raj Yoga thing and he'd sort of, he was playing with Don Burrows and um, he kind of pulled back from doing a lot of gigs, but he used to do stuff. And I, and I used to go and I, I had started having lessons with him privately. Mm-hmm. He was amazing. And, I, and I'd go and see him doing everything. I remember in 85 um, I went and heard him with Crossfire. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it was a version of Crossfire that they the, – Crossfire had sort of disbanded or they were just putting it back together every now and then. And, you know, I was underage and snuck into the basement <laughs> – uh, on a weeknight from school, I remember being really kind of wasted the next day at school, like really kind of <laughs> falling asleep. Yeah. But um, it was my first experience of live fusion and, you know, the basement was packed. I got this – I got to sort of sit on a, a bar stool right at the bar at the back, but I was standing on the rung to look over people's heads to hit, to see to, to see the band and it was – just insane. Like I, I was, I was on this exhilarating high to hear to hear David Jones in full flight. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. playing this incredible music. Um, it was just, you know, revelationary for me. It was yeah. amazing. You know, like moving. I still kind of get yeah, cool goosebumps. You know, yeah, it, yeah. yeah uh, you know, um, and that was my first exposure to sort of, I, I suppose, not. You know, not mainstream pop drumming or you know, like or, or rock drumming, um, like live. You know, so that you know that was that was amazing. And you know, another guy who came to my attention later, 
you know, that I missed out on him was was Mark Riley when he played with Crossfire. Um, if you ever get to hear the Crossfire live in Montreux, that's right. That's some incredible drumming, yeah. you know. Yeah. He, you know, Mark. Like, no. Yeah, he died really young. Uh, oh, it was right. Tragic um, on a motorbike accident. Yeah, you know, it's oh, terrible. Shit. But he was like a rising star, you know. Right. But he was, yeah, amazing. Um, so yeah, that was like that was. I just followed Jonesy around for the next few years, just right. doing just whatever he was doing with right. Don Burrows, with Mark Isaac's trio. Um, I'd, I'd help him out on sessions, like taking his gear around and you know yeah, doing, right. doing the whole thing, you know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and you know having lessons, and he was great. Like we, you know, he was always really uh, generous, you know, really giving, and you know, uh, yeah. but I, you know, I was. Starstruck, you know? yeah. Like I just, because I, I, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't work out how to get from where I was to where he was. You know, like right. it was just, it was sort of, it was, um, y- you know, otherworldly. I, I, right. you know, I thought, yeah, you know. yeah. I, I met David for, for the first. Uh, did you hear out? Yeah, I have. Yeah, 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 yeah right. Yeah. yeah, in the cafe. Oh, mm. it was it was great, man. Yeah. Um, Felt like I'd known him for years. Yeah, right. Yeah, from yeah. from the first hello, you know. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. He, he saw me down the street, Stevie. Yeah, you know, yeah right. Big, big hug and yeah, yeah. It's great. Yeah, yeah. He's had cool. a had a quite a profound impact on me. Right. That day, yeah, meeting him. So well, man, yeah. He's had a big. I mean, as I say, like he was ahead of that thing that all those guys caught on to in the states. You yeah, know? and right. um, I, I think it's, that's my take on it. You yep. know, um, but yeah, like. Yeah, he he had everything covered. I thought, you know, everything, and so, and and high level, and and so, the soloing was just you know, yeah right. off the scale. Yeah, um, like I told you, David told me that you were a good singer, <laughs> <laughs> but what he also told me because I spoke to him today, all oh, right, rang him today, okay, um, was you know you you're his greatest student. He believes. Oh, that's oh, yep. wow, wow. Um, that you're wow, not just a drummer, but just a, like a a true full musician. Oh, that's sweet. That's um, lovely, man. I mean, you know. Yeah, you're one of his favourite people. Oh, yeah, yep. that's, that's, that's so yep. lovely. I mean, it. And, and he said that what he would show you, you would then go away and, and deeply research that thing he showed you. So yeah. when you came came back to him on that thing, it was, it was on another level. Yeah, that's, that's, oh, that's another thing he said. That's lovely. I, yeah. I mean, I, you know. I was just in awe. So you yeah, know, right. If he told me to, you know, put my hand on the stave, I would have done it. You know. So yeah, right. Yeah, cool. <laughs> on the flame, open flame. Yep. Mm. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, and, and I mean, still to this day, like I, I, I hear him play, and it's, it's, it's just so unique too. I mean, I, I, I suppose I, did, I didn't realize because it became so, um, like everything to me. Mm. I didn't realize how unique it was in a way. Like, right. uh, um. But I do like I stand back and now and see it in context, and I see yeah. how individual. Mm. Because I I just thought, well, that's the that's the way you should play the drums, isn't it? You know, mm. like yeah. so right. so great. You know, mm. I mean, I'm I'm like that. I get affected by anything good. Like I, like I, I'll sort of I want to gravitate to that. But yeah, I mean, David was for you know for a good ten years. I I really just um, chased him down, and you yeah, know, right, that's cool. W- wanted you know. Mm. Wanted to know more. I, I was very hungry. Yeah, mm. <laughs> but and, yeah, and, yeah, go on. yeah, and and he started throwing some gigs your way and and that yeah. kind of thing, and yeah. you ended up with the Don Burrows gig. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. I mean, I was really, I was really fortunate. Um, when I left school, I, sh- I should actually. There's one. There's one thing. Just before I kind of get into into that, like the the one pivotal thing that that did happen to me at school. So I had this guy. Moro Ruby was my um, original teacher, and then he left, and a guy called Rob Grosser came along, and he was he continued the same stuff. He's great, great drummer. He's a nice guy. I've, I've ran, I ran into him a few years ago mm. at um, Threadbow, and he's he's a, he's a really great. He used to play with um, Boss, that band Boss, right. and um, and then after Rob, a guy, a, the teacher at the school they got was a guy called John Costa, Mark Costa's dad, and. You know, whereas Rob and Moro were, I guess, more kind of rock guys, like um, in a way. Um, 
John was an old he was an older cat and he was a he he'd come out of big bands. He was he was a he was actually a big Louis Belson guy. But right. but okay. buddy rich Louis Belson, but he re- right. he really dug Louis, you know. And he um I tell this story to my students, but um you know, he so it was a different a different perspective on things. And you know, I was kind of the hotshot guy at school and playing mm. in the bands and stuff, but you know, I played in the school bands, but I and I could read rhythms and drum beats, mm. you know, snare drum parts and so on. Mm. But when it came time to keeping my place in a drum chart, I I never bothered cuz you know, the stuff we were playing in the school band um you, you hear it once and you go, okay, right. I'll, I'll, like I'll come up with something better than that anyway. You know, well, <laughs> that's how, you know, the arrogance of, <laughs> of youth. But, but um, you know, that's how I felt. So I never really learnt to read charts back then. Um, so anyway, like properly. So then um, I got this guy, John Costa, and, and he, he was a big band guy. And he'd, he used to run a big band. He'd stopped playing by this stage because he, he had an injury, but he used to run this big band. And he said to me, Come down and have have it play with, <laughs> with the big band, you know. So I go down. It was at West Leagues, I think, and mm. you know, um, wherever that is. Mum took me down, you know, like uh, set set up my drums, you know, I'm a little Maxwin kid, I think it was. Um, <laughs> and I go down there, and there, he's putting up Thad Jones charts and and uh, you know Count Basie sort of stuff, and I absolutely blew it you know i was like, <laughs> like nowhere near it i was playing through the stops you know kept playing at the end of the song like didn't know the idiom didn't know how to swing wasn't really you know like it was it was a tragic you know <laughs> humiliating experience and there was right. sort of like semi pros in this band it wasn't a right. professional band but it was was, was mark playing with his dad at this no stage? no right. no i didn't meet mark for another few years okay you know? um but at this point he and his dad had had a falling out you know um no, actually, not not at that point, but later on. So yep. yeah, it was, it was a bit weird, but um, but you know, so it was this humiliating thing, you know, and so from that experience until my lesson the following week, I went through the whole gamut of emotions from going, well, you know, I don't want to play this old time crap anyway, to finally coming around by the time I got to my lesson to to saying, well, you know, if I'm going to do this, I, I need to work out, I need to learn how to do that, you know. So it was a real Wake up call, and I think for me, the pivotal moment that made me pursue it in a way of to become a professional rather than just a kind of glorified rock guy, you know, right? Um, to do it properly, you know. Gotcha. So, um, you know, those things while they're devastating at the time, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was great, um, a, a great experience in the long run. Yeah. So that that was the thing, but. And uh, so I'm, you know, I'm really grateful to to John for 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 doing that, <laughs> putting me in that. And I, I'm sure he knew what he was doing too. I'm sure it wasn't, you know, he was kind of. It wasn't. It wasn't meant to be easy. Probably a little lesson you needed to. Oh yeah. Yeah yeah. Well yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, so then I basically finished high school and took a year off. Um, yeah, as I said before, my dad my dad had died, and um, so I was pretty. Um, in a weird place anyway. Like it was sudden okay. as far as we knew then. Um, although, you know, he was overweight and he smoked. So, you know, it, like we know a lot more about that now. But um, so, yeah, I, I was in, it was at the end of year 11 when he died. So I did, I finished school and I was in, I sort of was in a daze for that whole next year really. Mm-hmm. The next few years, I suppose. But um, after leaving year 12, I had my HSC and all that. And I came from, like, the family was fairly, um, you know, like, um, I suppose uh, sort of a, like, we were all expected to go to uni and get a profession and, uh, you know, be kind of responsible citizens, you know. So the idea of of, um, being a musician, you know, I might as well have said, you know, I want to be an astronaut. It was that remote an idea concept, you know. Although I do remember, I did get a gig. Um, it would have been in year eleven. Sorry, was was that expected of you to have done that, or that's just how you? Oh no, I think it was expected. I think it right. was there. I mean, yeah, like I, I, you know, I quite like drawing. I was sort of interested in architecture and all that, like, okay. uh, like because I liked, I, uh, you know, I was I was okay at tech drawing at school and all that, and, and right. sort of that appealed to me. Um, 
but and I think my mum thought I'd I'd do that, you know. But I, you know, ironically, I think um, my dad dying was we were all so shocked that you know I thought uh, that I think even my mum thought, well, you know. You may as well do something you like. Like he was forty nine when he died. You know, oh, I'm, I'm fifty one now. So you know, it's young. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty trippy. Um, so I think my mum th- thought, well, maybe just try just this thing like, out. Go do what you like. Yeah, yeah because you know, if, you, <laughs> if that's it, like, what does it matter? Um, yeah, cool. To a point, you know. Um, but I was gonna say, yeah, I remember my dad. I had a gig. One of the teachers at school was a keyboard player, music teacher, and he, he had <laughs> a gig in a Chinese restaurant on a Friday and Saturday, and their, their drummer was away, and he asked me if I wanted to do it. So, you know, we got we had two nights there. It was like 50 bucks a night plus a feed, you know. And um, I remember my dad saying, like, we're driving somewhere after, and he's thinking, oh, 50 bucks, you know, it's 100 bucks. You know, this is like the 80s, you know. I mean, you could buy a house for, you know, 80 grand or something. Yeah. And he said, uh, he goes, oh. You know, do you reckon? Reckon you could do something with that? <laughs> you know, I was like, like it was sort of like, oh, oh, that's you know, it's not bad for a couple of nights, you know. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, so anyway, just cutting back to, um, so I finished school, um, and I, and that that next year I I deferred. I was I sort of got into uni on something, and deferred. Um, and I was playing with some original bands, just rock pop music. But about halfway through the year, I got a, a call from this guy saying, do you want to have a hit with a big band? And I can tell you, from that experience with John Costa to now, I'd really shattered my reading. And um, and I said, yeah, sure. You know, So I, I came up and had a, had, a, had a go with his band and it went well. And there was a trumpet player in the band called Mike Ryan and he used to do gigs. He had a Brazilian band. like He was a, he's, lives in Brazil now. He had a Brazilian thing going and I got into his band. We played Brazilian functions and stuff and, um, you know, we used to play... Had, had you learnt that music or just for, you just learned it by reading it? I'd, um, I'd learnt... I'd learnt from... By this point, I was, I was learning with D- Jonesy, you know. Right, okay. So, you know, I, I could play sambas and like... Okay. You know, in our Western I, sambas. I understand, you know? I understand what you're saying, yeah. Um, Gringo Sambas. Yeah. <laughs> but um but I learned a lot from those guys too. Yeah, and yeah. You, you know, I guess I I guess I had enough sort of facility by this point and enough groove that I got by, you know. Yeah. Um but you know, we used to play dances and things like that and you'd play these sambas at ding skid 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 and they were loud and you'd go for twenty five minutes like on this tempo, you know. So I kind of built up some mm. um some <laughs> strength, stamina, yeah, and yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah, all that stuff, you know. Mm. But um, uh, yeah. So so that was that was cool. And the leader of the band was a guy called Tony Gardner. The this big, the leader of this big band was a guy called Tony Gardner. He used to do club gigs, cabaret, you know, backing floor shows. So and he started taking me around and doing gigs. I would have been, um, you know, eighteen, seventeen, eighteen, something mm. like that. And um. You know, go and do these floor shows, and you know, like people would sort of turn their nose up at a lot of floor shows. But I really dug that at the time because it was this. I was kind of being professional and going in and making something of this these things. And uh, you know, I wasn't jaded and didn't uh, yet <laughs> <laughs> like thinking, oh, this is you know, daggy Tom Jones stuff. It was like, oh, cool, you know, Delilah. Well, you know, <laughs> like, you know. Um, but you know, and so that was that was fun. Like you know, it was was great fun for me. But um, so by the next, the end of that year, I'd sort of moved out of um, the the pop bands. I, I mean, I was sort of can't remember how that. I kind of just moving into playing more like professional, getting money for gigs, like doing this um, these shows. Uh, and then I went to the con to study, which was. Um, you know, at the time, the only place you could study the drum kit at a tertiary level in Sydney it was just way right. before AIM or um, right. JMC or any of those other other places. And mm. and the con, well, there were two things about the con. One was that Jonesy was there, so I thought, great, I get free lessons, free lessons, <laughs> <laughs> weekly lessons, free. Um, and 
Uh, the other was, um, it like it, well, the other thing about it that had a big impact on me was that it was a jazz course. It wasn't, um, it wasn't a contemporary. You know, it was it was specifically a jazz course. So, you know, my, you know, I said that Steve Gadden was a sort of bridge into jazz, and I, you know, I'd heard Buddy Rich, mm. but I I didn't know anything honestly yeah. <laughs> about small group jazz really. I didn't know about Tony Williams or Elvin Jones. I mean, I knew their names because I I used to read modern drama, you know, mm-hmm. or I would read modern drama. So I knew I knew these names, but I didn't know where they stood in history or how you know yep. where they stood yep. um, chronologically, even you, you know, um, or what sort of you know what what was the difference between swing and bebop and post bop and cool and you know, avant-garde and modern and gotcha. hard bop, you know. Yeah. It's, um, you know, I was sort of, it was really green, you know. So mm. um, so I got into the con and, you know, um, yeah, I auditioned, just got in on the, by the skin of my teeth that, you know, I had to play a bit of piano and mm. know some chords. And I actually, um, <laughs> I remember, um, well, it was a few years ago now, but I, like just out of the blue, it occurred to me because Jonesy was in the audition, right? So that it was Don Burrows, uh, might have been Craig. Well, Craig Scott played with me on the bass. Might have been George Gold. I can't remember who who else was that. Was Don Burrows, maybe George and and David, plus Craig on the bass. And you know we were playing different styles. You had to play brushes and you know swing beat and, and all that. And at, jo- at one point, Jonesy said. Uh, play play some funk, you know. So and that was kind of my more my bag, you know. Or, you know, so I I I played him played him a, a funk beat, and it was only years later, and I mean like you know, fifteen twenty years later, it dawned on me. He was throwing me a bone there. He was yeah. <laughs> he was going, he was throwing me a lifeline. You know, I was yeah. like you know, man, your swing suck, but you know yeah yeah yeah, get, show him some funk. Maybe that'll get out get yeah, out yeah. of trouble. You know, yeah. so. <laughs> Even though you know Don Don was not a funk guy, he right. was not a, a a big fan of the backbeat, you know. But um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there was Jonesy helped me out. That was That's beautiful. Cool. And I t- I sent him this text in the middle of the night somewhere, you know, saying I just realised, <laughs> you know, what you did for me, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah. But you know, so yeah, I started got to study with David for a couple of years, and I got really mm. exposed to jazz, and and I got to learn to like it, to to love it, in fact, you know, because right. I. Because it, you know, it wasn't a sound that I would naturally gravitate to. No, not coming um, from Zeppelin and yeah, or, or you know, mainstream pop. Like yeah. it was just you know, like a, you know, major chords and mm. like going to this sort of. Um, and I didn't understand what, you know, how the soloing worked and all that. I remember um, mm. going to see Bernie McGann during at, at the um, Suit Plus during high school, and you know, he um, it was Stewie Spear on the drums. You know, so I'm really. Do you know Stewie? No, he's a great drummer. He was he was right. in Max Merritt and the Meteors. And like, oh right, so okay. But he was a great old school, like no chops, but incredible ride cymbal beat. You know, like right. swinging beat. You right. know. Um, by that stage, he was he was getting on by that stage, and he could barely walk. You know, but he he sounded great. But I didn't get it. You know, I didn't understand. <laughs> like it's you know, Bernie's blowing. Over the changes, and I was thinking, what's well, like, you know, they're scrambling eggs up there. I don't know what's going on, <laughs> <laughs> you know. So, you know, it was was a foreign sound. So, but but right. you know, going to the jazz course um, Sorry, hit, hit, eggs. hit me too. Like, actually, I, I've stolen that phrase from Wayne <laughs> Wayne Shorter. You know, right? Yeah. Um, am I rambling too long? Is it, is no, it, man. Right? Okay. Yeah. I mean, we haven't got out of the eighties yet, so it's all good. Yeah. Yeah, I've got all night, man. I'm not working tomorrow. So. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Um. Well, I can tell you what happened to me at the con, so I think. Yeah, yeah, cool. Well, we're kind of talking. We were talking about the con mm. and how you were. You've sort of now know what all these different types of jazz were, and you're really starting to like it. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I really. Um, I remember an interview with Sting. Um, seeing this interview with Sting, where he talked about jazz and said, you know, I, it didn't appeal to him either. Same, I recognise that, and right. he said, but. He said, "I knew that studying it would be good for me, and and I think I knew that. So I kind of forced myself through that right. initial, um, you know, resistance. But but um, you ended up loving it. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I really, you know, and I, I, I mean, I didn't get 
loose playing, you know, like people talk about Alan Turnbull and, um, you know, I was, I was coming out of David Jones and this slick, clean, beautiful, you know, articulate yep. thing. And there's Alan playing, you know, fast and clever, but like cluttery, you know, this yep. sort of thing. Yep. And I didn't, I didn't understand it. When I, now I look at it and I go, wow, that's just gorgeous. It's just beautiful, it's just yeah. beautiful thing. Gotcha. Like, and, but I, but at the time I was like, oh, you know, or, or Elvin for that matter. It's like, oh, his, his triplets don't line up, you know. It's like, yeah. <laughs> like it's, yeah. you know, it was like, that's illegal, you know. Um, <laughs> that's a, to quote Andy Gander. That's right. A, that's a, ga- a Gander. <laughs> um, he was my next thing was yeah. Gander, Gander, discovering Gander, you know. Because yep. um, didn't he fill in for Dave? Yeah, that's corner? right. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Mm. Yeah, mm. he. Um, I mean, I yeah, I, I I'd, I'd met Andy. Um, funnily enough, at a <laughs> David Jones gig, um, it, it was a, a thing that he did. He put on with his Raj Yoga people. It was called a, Mi- a Million Minutes of Peace. And it was this concert at the Seymour Centre, and I, 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 you know, I snuck in there, <laughs> um, helping Jonesy. With did his you drums. Did you pay to go to any of David Jones's gigs? <laughs> 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 You're stuck into everything. Aren't you? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> well, I was working, man. I was setting his tubs up. Oh, that's I, right. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, no. I think I did pay. It was this thing was sold out, if, if I recall. And um, I, <laughs> I, uh, you know, I sort of. I can't remember. I can't remember how. But anyway, I'm, I'm backstage, and I heard Andy Gander with. Um, Steve Hunter's band. But interestingly, they played a ballad. It was this concert was a million minutes of peace and they, they came on, did one song and it was this ballad and it was beautiful. It's a thing called uh, Farewell, which um, Steve recorded on his um, home base album with Andy. Um, you know, it was beautiful. But Andy came up. I was just like a nerdy guy, you know, school guy on, sit, sitting on the side of the stage or, and he came up and said, hi, I'm Andy, you know, and he introduced himself. So that was, that was the first time we met. Um... And uh, yeah, so I was, you know, I was just hanging out. But but yeah, don't. Uh, and Jonesy went to India. He used to go to India um, once a year or every couple of years. And um, so one time, Andy filled in, and would have been. I was so I was at the con in nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine. So it would have been eighty eight probably. And <laughs> there were a lot of there were a lot of jazz. Nazis at the con, you know, like, and, and as I say, like I was, I can imagine. <laughs> yeah, but like, particularly in those days, they were sort of, you know, these kids out of school and they, they, jazz was the thing and they were all into it. And I hadn't, you know, I'd gone to the, <laughs> I'd gone to the, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm loosening up here, man. It's good. Yeah. <laughs> I'd gone to the, uh, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to get into canning people. Yeah. No, no, no. Um, so I won't name names. Yeah. No, but, yeah, like there was a whole jazz thing. But I, I really felt like an outsider um, in the jazz world because, you know, as I say, I'd come out of Led Zeppelin and here I am playing sort of Coltrane and, um, you know, trying to play Miles Davis kind of blues sort of, approach, you know, Jimmy Cobb thing and, and trying to get what that was or trying to get what Elvin was and... Mm. You know, a white boy from Sydney who watched Cold Chisel and Midnight Oil, you know. And who, who played funk at his audition. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. It's funk at the jazz course. What? That's that guy. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Well, man, I remember cats going, like, you know, we'd finish class and I'd get into a funk beat and they'd go, ah, oh, uh, stop. stop the backbeat, stop. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's horrible, the backbeat. No, it was illegal. Um, but, you know, like... It's it's funny now because all the all the New York cats, all the jazz guys play pretty mean funk, you know, like yep. these days, you know, yep. like and then it was sort of these two different worlds, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah, so I, I can't. Yeah, anyway, where, where was I? Like, um, some, you know, I did the jazz course and and, and Andy fills Andy's in, there, yeah. yeah. And but what was great was Andy and I sort of hit it off, you know, because um, and I, you know, he was a he was a he was a highly regarded jazzer mm. but he could do anything he could you know he could play anything um he's you know he could do anything he wants that guy mm. <laughs> you know? um but he was known as a jazzer mm. and you know he come up through the benders or well he was in the north side big band and then the benders which was this you know the benders no. oh man oh wow they were really Revolutionary and right, uh, like post bop sort of hard hard bop, but odd timey and complex and Dale Barlow and Lloyd Swanton, Chris Abrahams and and Andy and later um, 
Jason Morfitt. Um, but, you know, so they were like these kids but playing super high level, you know, in the mid-'80s. They were just insane, you mm. know, like high-level, sophisticated, clever, modern jazz, you know. Mm. Um, but, but, you know, so Andy was this jazzer and yet he and I really hit it off, which always sort of surprised me because he, I think he, he dug my enthusiasm for the drums and all things drumming, you know. Right. Um, you know, so we, we had a great time and, 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 well, I had a great time with him. He, he kind of hit me to the Gary Shafey books and sort of polyrhythmic stuff and, um, yeah, that was that was a different thing from David. David's, yeah, I mean, I, I was completely taken with David, um, but when Andy came along, I recognised it was a great thing because I recognised that here's this other voice and sound that is so um, equally high level but completely different yeah yeah, yeah. 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 you know and that was a that was a great thing yep. i should also say there were, there were other guys at the time like i was a big big fan of mark meyer do you know mark no i don't really okay mm. i must be old <laughs> no no i just i just need to get out more maybe <laughs> <laughs> well you know look mark's moved back to adelaide mark was this great drummer from adelaide and um he played with a band called he was in moving pictures um oh right okay but he played in a band called Chasing the Train and I was lucky because by the time I was sort of old enough, aside from sneaking into the basement, that our local pub was the Bayview at, at Gladesville yep. and Chasing the Train used to play there a lot. Yep. So I used to go <laughs> and stand, on, you know, next to the Dunnies and just stare at Mark all night, you know, watch it playing the drums. Years later he said, oh, I thought you were gay. <laughs> just checking, stand, checking you out, man. Checking him out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I was, you know, I mean, and that, like I was like that. I just look at the drums all night. It wouldn't matter, right. who, you know. But but like Mark was this beautiful, hard-hitting, um, like really passionate, articulate drummer. Like he had, he, Mark's got this, um, he, 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 nothing he plays is sort of, particularly complex or or not understandable but the and it's the stuff that most people can play but he just plays it with this um conviction and beautiful unique touch and t and time like he's a time machine it's beautiful like i think a lot of people actually say that about you oh well i mean apart from well, the stuff that people can't understand you play because you can play <laughs> some but i mean well that's lovely but but i mean i'd say um that's something I got from Mark, you know. I mean, I got, right, okay. I, you know, I've I've got something from everybody. I've I've ripped yeah, everybody off. Yeah. Don't, don't worry about that. <laughs> but yeah, Mark would play. That's that's nice to know. But you yeah. know, thanks. <laughs> Sweet. But I think yeah, like yeah, Mark would play these things, and it would just mean so much. Simple things that meant so much, you know. And that's I love that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I was sort of, you know, it was that was more the rock sort of funk thing. Mark was a big uh, um, little. They played a lot of Little Feet in okay. in that band. That was yep. Mark was a big Richie Hayward guy. Yeah, and, right. Or they were a, a Little Feetish type band. They okay. played a lot of Little Feet stuff. And um, you know, I mean, I dug Richie too. I got into Richie in later high school mm. too. And um, funnily enough, you know, it's sort of not hip to say it. Like everyone says, oh, Little Feet after Lol George wasn't the same. But I I, only, I got into them after Lol jo yeah, George right. had died. And um, you know, it was fine by me. I like I. Richie was beautiful, you know, like late eight, like the uh, Let It Roll record and mm -hmm. the couple after that representing the Mambo and, um, mm. you know, they were, I, I, you know, I loved him. Mm. <laughs> he had a great way too of playing things that are sort of everybody plays but having his own take on it, you right. know. Yeah. Mm. But, but I was, I suppose, in my own playing by... This, but just because I was in the jazz course and I was in those circles, um, moving in a more jazz yep. kind of a direction, I mm -hmm. guess you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, as I say, I learned to love it. I got, you know, started working around town. Mm. Um, I got into Mike Knox's band, which was you know who Mike Knox is, yep. being a Kiwi mm -hmm. and all that. Um, much to the uh, chagrin of. Many of the jazz policemen at the course, because <laughs> that's like he's this suburban rock guy playing. Like getting with Mike Knox, <laughs> <Yeah, that's right. laughs> upset everybody. Yeah. So, so how did that 
How did you get that gig then? Well, he was teaching at the con. He right, was okay. he was one of the teachers at the con. And it was it was a funny thing, man, because Mike, um, Mike, how can I say this? I mean, yeah. I, I often say, like, I learn a lot from Mike despite him teaching me. Right. <laughs> he, Mike could uh, – he could say stuff that would confuse you more than, than you know, shed a light. But um, but I got a lot from him, you know, um, and more probably more playing in his band than doing – than in, in the classes, you know. And, you know, there'd be, there'd be times when we'd be in the class and he'd be har- he'd just harangue me all day, you know, like he'd be right. <laughs> he'd be on me, you know, and he'd say, no, man, no, <laughs> you know, hey, man, like, bam, like, you know, yeah, whack it, man, like, no, no, lay out, lay out, like, you know, <laughs> and, you know, there'd be times, like, I'd, I was sort of, you know, I'm just out of school, I was a year out of school and, you know, like some kid and I'm thrown in with these sort of heavy jazz people and I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, but... um <laughs> he'd, he'd be, you know, like I, there'd be times I'd think I played okay that that lesson that, that that in that class, and he'd say it was terrible. And there'd be times when I'd think it was terrible, and he'd say that was great. And there'd be times when he'd say it was great, and I thought it was great. And there'd be times when he thought it was terrible. And so it was like every combination. Oh, right. So I couldn't work out what was good and bad, you know. And and this sort of culminated to the point where I was I was about to sort of you know <laughs> tell him to stick it, you know. And, I said, and he said after the class, he said. Yeah, I got a gig next week. You want to come and do it? You know, so oh, cool. like, and, that, and so I did this gig and then joined his band. You know, um, and that was a cool band. Cameron Undy played the bass. Um, Cameron, who runs the Five Hundred Five now. Do you think he was testing you? Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's his thing, man. You know? Right. So he's, but I mean, he was that, fucking with you on purpose. Yeah. That, oh, I mean, you're I, right. I, yeah. uh, well, to a to a to a degree. I think just no. Well, no, I think he wanted. Something, but he ne- didn't necessarily know how to say it, you know. Okay. Um, I don't think it was – I don't think he's been mean. No, no, not being um, mean, just, just yeah. testing you, making sure you're, I, you're the guy. I don't know. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> but, I mean, I'm not the first. Like, everybody's okay. gone – everyone who's played with Mike knows that, that right. thing. Right, um, You know. But that was a great experience playing with him because it was sort of um, – that was modern jazz, and and you know by this time, by this stage, I'd sort of, um, you know, as I say, I kind of got my reading together for for big band and stuff, and I was pretty confident with all that, you know, where I was kind of <laughs> getting cocky, you know, um, and um, <laughs> I, I tell the story of my audition for the Con Big Band, you know, um, Ralph Pyle loves loves this story. And, he got me to tell it the other day up in Brisbane. I was doing a gig with some cats up there and they wanted to hear the story. Or well, Ralph said, you know, tell them the story. But oh, it's, So Don Burrows is, in the, they auditioned the drummers in the course for who would be in the big band. And um, so Don tells us, uh, Don, Don's taking the band and um, I'm listening to the other guys playing and I'm thinking, oh, yeah, you know, like, like oh, yeah, he's, he's not giving it enough grunt. Like I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm going to smash this. Like you know, and I, I was yeah, as I say, I was pretty confident with, with my reading and stuff. And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to kick this. So I'm going to get in there and belt it. You know, like this is going to be great. So I get in there and he calls a chart. Um, that's called half and half, which is half swing and half Latin, half a samba thing. And the other thing I should say is that in those days the con had these um, the drum kits at the con. They, they weren't bebop kits. They had these two tama. <laughs> Tama swing stars oh. with 22 inch kick drums and no front head and nothing inside them. Right. right? So, you know, we get into the samba and I'm going, get like building it, you know. And at the end, Don, Don Burrows leans over and he says, Yeah, sounded good. Yeah, sounded good, mate. A little bit heavy on the bass drum there, you know. <laughs> and I said, Oh, you know, it's like a kid, you know. I said, I said, oh, yeah, well, there's nothing inside it. There's no pillow inside it. He said, yeah, because you blew it out the fucking door. He said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which, I've told Don that story in recent years. And he, yeah. Uh, yeah, we've got to get a laugh, you know. Right. But, um, <laughs> yeah, it's great. But anyway, uh, where am I? <laughs> I mean, I could just talk about the con. Yeah. Um, but I joined Mike Knox's band and yeah. uh, Gander had played in, in Mike's band before okay. and, you, you know, um, it was amazing, you know. It was incredible, um, but um, y- you know that's the kind of jazz tradition is to get some, you know, young cats in and then, and then move on, you know. Right. So you know, and I, but I learned a lot about 
um, modern jazz because as I say, like I I sort of played big band and swing, you know, um, and, and and you know, and there's different types of big band as well. But I'm talking sort of count bassy, you know, straight ahead, you know, um, that sort of thing. So to play modern jazz was with Mike, um, you know, there was a lot of nuance to it. It was it was great, you know. Um, I learned, yeah, I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot from Roger Frampton, who was there, who ended up being my father-in-law. Right. <laughs> um, uh, and Jonesy, and and you know, and I met Gander, so it was a great, right. a great thing. Mm. But once I'd finished the jazz course, um, I I was really kind of working in that scene more than the the pop scene, right. which was weird because I I still, you know, I'd never left pop in my head, but I was. I was just in that circle by that time. Right. By that time. And I, uh, um, I got into the house band, the house trio at the Donborough Supper Club, um, which was Ray Aldridge and often Gary Holgate or Lloyd Swanton um, or Alex Hewitson on bass. And we used to back a lot of different acts and stuff and mm. playing straight ahead. So that was, you know, a great experience mm. playing small group, small group mainstream jazz. Yep. So I was doing that. I was playing with Mike Knox band. Um, There's this great club at the time called the Blue Note, um, which wasn't affiliated with the Blue Note and probably these days would be sued for it, you know. Right. Um, in King Street it was. Mm. There was a bunch of clubs. There was the Blue Note, the Real Ale Cafe and the um, the Suit Plus, all, mm. you know, 300 metres from each other. You right. Know? Um, but the Blue Note was this great room and Mike used to have, Mike Knock had a gig there on, I think it was Wednesdays. And Andrew Spate had a bebop band there on Tuesdays, and the and the manager, <laughs> who was a crook, you know, uh, but he he said to Andrew, "Can you bring us in something that's a bit more contemporary fusiony, um, not fusion fusion, but jazz, but not you know, um, for a Thursday night." And, and so Andrew put this band together called Splatch, and that was Splatch was a, one of the tunes from a Miles Davis tutu from the tutu record and so um, it was me and Alex Hewitt's and Marty Love who recently tragically yeah, yeah yeah man um, yeah that was wild that's you know mm. yeah um, Marty played keys um, Paul Thorne or Greg Thorne depending on when you've Met him. <laughs> he, was, he was. He changed his name. Oh it, right, it yeah, he was. Right. I think he was actually originally Paul, but when he came, he was in Kiwi. When he came here, he called himself Greg, and everyone called him Greg, and then he changed it back to Paul, which confused everybody. Um, <laughs> Spadey on percussion and um, on percussion. Spadey on uh, saxophone, alto sax. Um, what I said everyone, Alex Hewitt and Ben Butler on guitar. Ben's now in New York doing great things over there. Um, and the singer was Erin Clark, who you would know, right? Um, <laughs> I just assume all Kiwis know every all the Kiwis, yeah. <laughs> Barry Leaf, Erin. Yeah. Um, and anyway, so we got this, you know, regular gig every Thursday night and um, playing at the Blue Note. It was a great club, and and the band was great. And we played stuff from we played the sort of latest Miles stuff from the eighties, the the Tutu and. I don't know if a man even might have even been before a mandler came out, but it was it was two turn man with a horn, those sort of things, and um, so the funk, the funk, sort of hip hoppy miles, and we played David Sanborn things and whatever, and then Erin e- would sing as well, so it was a great combination of this sort of instrumental fusion stuff and kind of that contemporary slick vocal music, you know, mm-hmm. groove music. Um, so whilst I was sort of working mainly in the jazz world, and I'm not sure if, no, it wasn't, I, yeah. So <laughs> I'm working mainly in the jazz kind of thing, doing the, the house band at the um, supper club, Donborough Supper Club, playing with Splash, playing with Mike Knock, filling in. I got some calls like back then filling in with James Morrison and even Don Burrows when David couldn't do it and, um, you know, and things for Andy, like Andy was, you know, he, he was, he, he went out with, um, Vince Jones and so yeah. he'd throw me his stuff. So I was playing, you know, a lot of Spangalang straight ahead, yeah. you know, yeah. 
so, but anyway, but Erin's thing was kind of getting back to a backbeat, you know, getting back to that. Uh, and because Erin was there, she was doing a lot of studio work at the time, mm. all the kind of studio cats would come down and see the band. Right. And that kind of got me into that circle. Right. So I sort of, um, you know, started working with people like Phil Scorgy, who had a band called The Right Stuff, was like a, a funk band. And Doug Gallagher had played in that before and... Great, he's great drummer. It's dark. It was really. There's a pocket, man. There's a like a serious musical pocket. Do you, do you know Doug? Like, no. Really, no. I'm, I was, man. I mean, these are all names that are just so um, front and center for me, and and, yep. and 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 were for years. You know, like there's a lot of guys, and and this is the. This is the great thing about what you're doing. Is you're that, just gonna, it's. Putting a bit of spotlight on these guys too. So. Yeah, yeah. So I'll go away now and yeah, because man, look them up. I mean, people of you know of my generation who are around know about you know <laughs> they know about Mark Meyer, they know about Warren Daly, they know about Will Dower and, and Doug Gallagher, um, and I don't want to leave anyone out. But there's yep. like they know, like there was just all these cats were doing great things, you know, like mm. and for a long time and doing it at a high level. Um, you know, do you know about Warren Daly? I've heard the name Warren Daly. Wow, man! I mean, yeah. yeah, I mean, he's he's the king of big band. He's the right. swingiest big band guy, um, and he was, you know, he was really important historically. I think you know, like, um, and I don't, I, you know, I'm not saying that because it, I, I, I understand why people can't know about this, but about about these guys, but. Um, I see that in students too, where, where students might know they'll know about Buddy Rich and Steve Gadd and um, you know Bill Stewart and so, but they they don't know about Tony Williams. Yeah, and right. It's like, well, how does that happen? But yeah. but I can see. I, I mean, I can see how it happens. Yeah. But it, it's sort of all these things I take for granted. They're just part of my um, my background. You know, yeah, like yeah. like Doug Doug and Will did the midday show forever. You know, right. Um, it's like Graham Morgan in Melbourne and Ronnie Sanderlands and, you know, they, they were all, they were kind of fixtures, you know, those, yeah. those, those cats, working, working, working guys, but, but like classy, you know. Yeah, so, so, you know, like at the same time as doing the sort of mainstream jazz work, a bit of modern jazz work, a bit of fusion, whatever around town, um, I'm getting called for like jingles and bits and pieces like that, like that's starting, yeah, right. starting to happen. Um not so much albums then, but but yeah, jingles and you know, little bits and pieces, and that was you know great experience. Like I, I thought it was pretty cool being a session guy, you know. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, by the time so that sort of that which is talking like nineteen eighty nine. Um, so by the nineties, I can't remember exactly when it happened, but probably around about nineteen ninety, early nineteen ninety, Jonesy left. Don Burroughs band and um, and they offered me the gig you know, I'd sort of filled in a few times for, for David and um, you know got the got the gig which was amazing you know like I was uh, just like you know how old would I have been 20 21 or something like mm. and you know through Don <laughs> I mean, like in a way it was sort of um, I mean I was touring at a like a comfortable level from the from the you know from get the you know right. out the gate like we, we you know he didn't he was um, he was doing things comfortably you know we were staying in nice places and yep. everything was smooth and run well I was getting paid well yep. um, I blew a lot of money on CDs I can tell yeah, you right. like man you know <laughs> I used to get paid and go down to um, Birdland Records and. Drop five hundred bucks on, on records, you know, um, you know, kids wouldn't understand that now. With, no, you know, no, it's like, right. what do you mean you, <laughs> what do you mean you paid? Got a, a fifty dollars iTunes card. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just spend it all on one one session. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I, I was listening to a lot of music and getting getting, you know, right into a lot of music and. Yeah, so started working with with Don, and so touring with Don in those early like early nineties, um, and we you know we went did a lot of like, well, a bit of international stuff. Went mm. to New Zealand, um, we and did a 
run with – we did a couple of gigs on our own, but then did, did a run with um, Louis Belson and Anita O'Day. And oh, wow. um, Bill Stewart was there with – John Schofield and all that. So, you know, I kind of saw some cool stuff and, yeah. you know, um, got to have dinner with Louis Belson, which yeah, was right. amazing, you know. Um, he's the gentleman everyone says he says he was, you know. Um, did a lot of touring with Don. Um, and he didn't tour that hard, though. So, you know, like you might do sort of six nights somewhere and then nothing for a month and then okay. a couple of nights in town and then... The next month you'd do, you know, a couple, like a two-nighter and a four-nighter or something, you know, so it was a, a bit of that. Yep. And that was that was cool. I was sort of earning proper money and mm. they're still living at home, you know. I was kind of, yeah, everything was pretty up, easy. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, and I was right into the drums. I was just mad for it and, um, and music. I was just soaking everything up. Mm. Um, and I did that for the next couple of years. And then I started, I remember, I, I, well... Hamo, Hamish Stewart was, there's another drummer, man, yeah, Hamish, yeah. you know. Yep. Have you interviewed Hamish? Not yet. Yeah, man. Yeah. I mean, like, well, you know, when we used to do the Supper Club, um, I remember seeing him, I used, I used to be in the house band in the Supper Club with Ray, and I remember seeing, they used to have two bands a night, um, and Hamo would play, um, he'd come in after us and play with Aaron O'Clark um, in Aaron's band. Mm. And I remember hearing him one night with Mark Costa on the bass. And mm. Man, it was so deep. Like, yeah, right. oh, this, wow. Like, that was a groove. Mm. Um, and Hamish was doing everything mm. at the time. You know, he was he was everywhere. Mm. And so was John Watson. You know about what I? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I've got a, yeah, I've um, recently connected with... With Watto on Great. on Facebook. Great, yeah, yeah. Um, I ran into him oh, a couple of months ago in Adelaide. Yeah. <laughs> he, was, he was in good form, man. Yeah, yeah. He's he's a cracker too. But that, Hamish, really, the like the sort of working guys, and I'm talking about at, not in the jazz scene necessarily, but the working cats around town was Hamish and 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 Watto in the late eighties, early nineties. Right. Um, I mean, Gander was doing a lot more in the jazz scene. Um, that was the other thing that happened with Gander was that he moved to Melbourne to do Steve Weizard, right? Um, which left a, a big hole for yeah, me, yeah, right? You know, awesome. like, like in Sydney, like he and I become really good friends, and um, although you know I was in awe of him, <laughs> right. but uh, you know we 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 were good mates, and mm. it, but yeah, he'd moved to Melbourne and was doing Weizard. I think he did that. Well, I did it ninety three. And then um, Nico was 92 so and Andy did it for two years, two or three years, probably two. Yeah. So it would have been um, 92, 91, 90. So, yeah, he would have moved to Melbourne. So that's like I was doing – I picked up a lot of work because David was um, backing out of stuff, you know. It, um, he To he, concentrate on his thing. Yeah, yeah. he – like, well – yeah, both. He, I think he's. I think he, like he. He really had gone hard in the late seventies, and I think yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, if you ever talked to him about pyramid and stuff like that, yeah, did, yeah. that really hit him hard when all that fell over, you know. Yeah. Um. And this was some time later, but yeah, he was sort of, you know, kind of on a path of discovery, I guess. You know, I hope I'm not talking out of turn, but no, um. Not at all. Yeah, he, you know, so so he was pulling back from a lot of stuff, um, and just doing, just picking and choosing things he he wanted to do artistically, mm -hmm. and, you know. And he, you know, he was a great um, working drummer, like so, like Virgil Donati, like they were they were they were great sort of, you know, a, a, just not withstanding the technique and the artistic thing that they both yep. had all along, and then developed further. They were great, you know, tradesman drummers too. Like yeah, they, you know, they could right. go and read anything and, right. you know, do the right thing, know what, know how, you know, they were they were classy cats, you know. Mm. Um, they are classy cats, yeah. I should say, you know. Um, but, yeah, David um, was sort of pulling out and doing, doing more artistic things that he wanted to do. Right. Um, and Andrew had moved to Melbourne so there was this sort of gap for people who played that, 
played that style, like, and right. you know, and I was having a crack at it, I suppose, um, <laughs> of sorts. Um, but um, you know, and Steve Hunter, like Andy had played in Steve Hunter's band. I got the gig with Steve. Right. I got the gig in Steve McKenna's band. I was playing with Dale Barlow, um, and the Harbourside Brasserie was open. This club down at yeah, yeah. Uh, under the Harbour Bridge, yep. and that was that was a scene, and that was a yep. great great vibe down there. And all of those bands, we'd work there all the time and people would come out man They're like we were getting good crowds yeah. um and so i had i'd usually be there at least sort of like once a week or you know like maybe three times a month um mm. at the harbside brasserie with with some someone or other doing right. you, you know not just like we're playing and people are coming to see us play sort of thing so that was that was a great scene yeah. in the early early 90s um yep. lots of Lots of cool stuff going on. And, I, you know, I mean, I was sort of, I was just having a great time. I was you know, playing with these bands and uh, working on, like, all I had to think about, I didn't have kids and family and yeah. mortgage. I was just, yeah. all I thought about was the drums and, mm-hmm. you know, how I could play in the, with these things. And all I had to think about was getting my drums there and, yeah. you know, learning some music and, yeah. like, mu- music. And trying I, to get I, home. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. Mate, yeah, it was a good time, and I go, I go from doing sort of fusion gigs to kind of pop gigs. I was also in um, um, uh, Karen Mitchell's band at the time, and she she was a singer around town. She is still she's still around, but she's um, singing a lot. And we she had a band with Alex Hewitson, um, and we you know they were getting a lot of work. We'd work up the cross, we'd work up the we do the late show at the supper club. So sometimes I'd be there. At the supper club doing the early show and the late show and you know right. with different bands you know right. um yeah it was just a great time you know it's like yeah. Yeah. i mean it wasn't uncommon um to be doing you know 15 gigs a week yeah. like just running around from gig to gig mm-hmm. i had a regular little standards gig on a sat- uh, saturday afternoon at the um whitehorse inn in surrey hills and i just you know playing with um you know these old cats <laughs> well, i thought they were old cats then um, playing straight ahead jazz, like mainstream jazz, doing Sinatra things and standards, and John Away played the bass, and yeah, you know, it was it was great, man. You know, I learned a lot of stuff. Learned to one of the things that happened because of doing so much work, doing so many gigs, was I kind of got sick of my own playing. I kind of got sick of um, resorting to the same things. Yeah, no, no, exactly. That's why I came and saw you. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> well, but, you know, I mean, I, I guess I, I remedied that by, I have to say, like by getting deeper into the groove, I, I like by loving that more, you know. Um, so I think there was a time when I, my, I simplified my playing to to just concentrate on that. And, I, you know, I was always I was always deeply moved by Steve Gadd, you know. He was the cat um, for that, you know, for yeah. the, like it was, there's something about him. Um, it still is, you know, like it's so, it's so sincere, <laughs> you know. I was thinking for the next uh, round ta- uh, not the, well, the um, spotlight yeah, yeah. series that we do, yeah. I want to do Steve Gadd. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So would you? Oh, man, I'm there in a shot. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah for awesome. sure. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Had, oh, you, totally. had you on my mind about that one. Oh, mate, yeah, I, yeah. Know. Before we sort of segued off into that, and I was, yeah, yeah. I think we talk. Were we talking about Mark Kennedy? Well, Mark was. I, w- I had the um, Kirk Laronge no, apostro- no apostrophe record. Mm. I, I think maybe my sister had us. You know, I stole it from somewhere, but that was Mark Kennedy on it. You know, right. like he he um, he was. He was ahead of his time. Here, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, and have you have you spoken to Mark? Like, I haven't spoken to Mark. Right. I, I've tried to contact Mark. Um, right. When I had Johnny on here for his like solo interview, yeah. he spoke a lot about Mark. Yeah. Because um, Johnny used to just follow Mark around town. Yeah, that's right. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Setting well, his drums up. And he was a boss, Mark. You know, and um. I mean, you know, the Ayers Rock stuff. Mm-hmm. Mark and Hamish, you know, Hamish, Hamish yeah. followed Mark. But they, they had, you know, Mark's got this Richie Hayward thing too. Like yeah, a, right. a different take on it from Mark Meyer, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but, the, you know, there's sort of deep, um, 
There's the deep love comes through when you hear those cats and 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 it's a love of the the musicality of it rather than the technique of it. Yeah, I understand. Cuz it's sort of it's easy to get taken by the technique of things, you know. And yeah, I yeah. think people do these days, you know, like yeah. in in a way that I mean, yeah, Buddy Rich is there's Buddy Rich is undeniably you know stands up in any era like oh, the man. facility N- not only stands up probably shreds actually oh, you know I, I, i've got this ongoing argument with james muller about you know who's technically better Vinny or, or buddy rich <laughs> you know Ooh, I, I yeah. mean it was just just we have a laugh with it but you know it's only been going for about 15 years right uh, <laughs> vinny has got vinny has got more splash symbols <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you and know, a side snare. <laughs> I, I, I say it with my tongue firmly in, in cheek because it's, yeah, you yeah. know, it, like it's it's about who who they are as musicians. But, sure. um, but you know, there's this great, uh, you know, um, drum channels got they they found this um, Buddy Rich TV show that was produced. He did a like a show as as the with guests and stuff, and they're all jazz people, like Ella Fitzgerald and Lionel Hampton. And, and really? Like, yeah, and, and they found the tapes. It was never, it was never aired, and they found it and, and put it out on the DVD. Um, and there's a couple of clips of it, but there's a clip of them rehearsing with Lionel Hampton. And two things struck me. One was that um, it's just rehearsal, right? So they're, they're kind of chatting as they play. One was that Lionel plays this solo, and there's nothing extraneous in it. It's just... Beautiful line, making all the changes, melodic, you know, swinging through this this line in in a logical, like as if it was a written solo. But it's not. He's just mucking around. He's just sort of chatting and playing this beautiful thing. That was one thing. The other thing is that Buddy's playing time, and um, he's not. It's not. There's no. It's, there's no soloing in this clip. It's, not, it's just Buddy playing time, mm. and it's the deepest, swingiest, drivingest, you know, grooviest swinging time. <laughs> like, yeah. You know? yeah. And like I know um, James Morrison's good friends with Jeff Hamilton, you know, and Jeff Hamilton was worked a lot with Ray Brown, and he said to Ray, "So who was the best drummer you ever played with?" You know who had the best groove, and he said, "Well, Buddy Rich." And he said, um, "He said not the Buddy Rich, you know, as in the the show chops Copy, yep. guy, but just for time and pocket, like playing swinging time, mm. there was nothing like it, you know." Mm. And I know exactly what he means. Like, you know, it's just I love that drive of that that pocket, you know. And and when Buddy. You know, there's a great line, you know, uh, st- I'm jumping around all, all over the place. But there's a great line in the, I think it's in the 10th anniversary of Modern Drummer. Right. Which, again, I still think of as a, as recent, but it's got to be 1988. <laughs> there's an interview with um, Steve Gadd and um, he says, he says, you know, a, a good groove cuts through a whole lot of bullshit, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, you yeah, know, I'm, I'm, I really... <laughs> That's how I'm thinking. So true, eh? Yeah, Yeah. well, I I think so, you know. Mm. Well, that concludes part one of the Gig Life podcast with Gordon Rickmeister. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, I certainly did. Can't wait to bring you part two. Coming really, really soon, so stay tuned. Talk to you soon.